Everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Atheist Experience. I'm Matt Delaney. Joining me this week's Jeff D. It is Sunday, August 29th, 2010. 29th, yeah. We're live. How are you doing? Good. You? Um, so, so. We'll see. <laughs> I'll try and perk myself up for the show. You're going to be fine. Uh, you notice they listed me as a host in the credits. Yeah. I, Did they list us both as hosts? I probably. I didn't even really care. Awesome. We don't need, we don't need labels and titles on there. It's Matt and Jeff. <laughs> Yeah. What more are you looking for? We are live, as I mentioned. Uh, this is a public access television program sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. The ACA has weekly meetings every Sunday at Romeo's on Barton Springs Road beginning at around 1130, except for the first Sunday of the month when we host our lecture series at the Austin Histor History Center located at the corner of 9th and Guadalupe. And the lectures begin at roughly 1215. You probably want to be there right at noon when the doors open. Uh, I don't have the info on the next lecture that's coming up, but in addition to that, the ACA also sponsors what was a bi-weekly internet audio podcast, but it's been on hiatus, and it's scheduled to return in the near future. We'll be making uh, announcements, and it may no longer be bi-weekly. Um, it might, by way of apology, end up being weekly or as close to weekly as we can. It's called The Nonprofits, and for more information, you can go to www.nonprofitsradio.com. That's P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S, and we'll have, we'll have things posted both at that site and at the ACA main site, uh, which is www.atheist-community.org. There you'll find a frequently asked question page, a calendar of events, information on the organization, how to participate, special notes about upcoming events, and a lot of other information. If you, uh, if, if you look there now, you'll see that we're, we're announcing and taking registration for the Bat Cruise. Our annual Bat Cruise is September 25th. And there's still places available. Stop by the website, fill out your application, and, and you, can, you can be included on that. It's September 25th, 2010 at 6 p.m. Austin has the largest metropolitan population of bats uh, in the world. And so we rent a big boat. We go out on, on the lake, which is actually a dammed up river, but that doesn't matter. And we bring out drinks and food and chit-chat and talk and watch the bats go out for the nightly feed. Uh, it's a good bit of fun, and this year, before the event actually occurs, um, at it, the the backers will, will, be, will be meeting at 6 p.m. At 3 p.m. at the UU Church here in town, I'll be giving my lecture on the superiority of secular morality. Um, that begins at 3 o'clock, so we'll do that as kind of a pre bat cruise event thing and then head on out. Um, other things of note, I had mentioned previously that Americans United was going to have a, a, a meeting, special event uh, guest come in in September to discuss how believers and non-believers can communicate more effectively. Um, the date for that's been changed. Uh, I don't have all the new information, but you can visit uh, the Americans United website for Austin. I think it's auaustin.org, but I'll have to double check. We'll get something posted about it as soon as we can, and, and I'll toss out a reminder next week, um, assuming it's not too late. Um, October 8th through 10th is the Texas Free Thought Convention in northern Texas, which is kind of like Oklahoma, but we, we let that slide. In the Dallas area, uh, where there is a huge population of atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, secular humanists, who we're hoping we'll all get together, you can go to Texas Free Thought Convention, or ooh, TexasFreeThoughtConvention.com, I believe is the right website. I may be wrong on that too. For some reason, I don't have all my website info in front of me, so I, I told you I was slacking today. That's right. October 8th through 10th. Um, their list of speakers is up there. I, uh, I'll be there. Jen will be there. We're planning on setting up uh, a table with some of the audio equipment from the nonprofit show to record interviews with the guest speakers. Uh, we won't be broadcasting anything live. Uh, there's a uh, Wi-Fi access is sketchy at best, and we didn't want to try to be broadcasting you know, like a 24-hour thingy. Um, and November 16th, I'll be somewhere in between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore at UMBC 
for a debate. And I'll get you more information as we get closer to November, but I wanted to at least get the word out there. Who with? I can't tell you right now. Oh. We're, we're going to be debating the origin of human morality. Uh-huh. And, and, and that's pretty much always decided right now. And even that may change. But yeah. it, at least something's going forward for the people who wanted to, to have an actual kind of formal debate. It looks like it's, uh, it's actually going to come to pass now. In addition to all these events, the ACA also has a happy hour every Thursday at around 7 o'clock at the Dog and Duck Pub at 17th and Guadalupe. And when this show's over, we're on until 6 p.m. Everybody involved gets together and goes to dinner at Threadgill's, 301 West Riverside Drive. We'll be down there around 3.30 or so, or 3.30, 6.30 or so. Any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to come to any of our events. You don't have to be a member to attend, uh, but if you're coming down to preach, proselytize, or provoke, provoke, please don't. Just pick up the phone and give us a call where we'll be happy to talk to you about whatever. Because I don't know, you, you didn't bring anything in particular. I don't have anything prepared today, though I am expecting that we're going to get calls about the so-called Ground Zero Mosque. Because it's all over the news and it's well, religion related. I'm, sh I'm sure we will now that you've primed Actually, the Actually, you know, uh, I, it, um, if I say we're prepared to talk about it, then it's almost guaranteed we won't get any theists calling that in may be the case. on that subject. But, yeah. or Muslims. So we're just, I guess we're going to just dive right into callers today. The telephone number's up there. As a reminder, um, anybody who doesn't get through today or doesn't want to get through today can email tv at atheist-community.org. That goes to myself, the co-host, some of the people behind the scenes. We cannot possibly answer all the email that comes in, but we do read it. And if you put AETV or NPR in the header, you'll be more likely to make it through everybody's spam filters, or at least mine. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and start taking calls right off the bat. we got Mike in Ohio. Yeah, nice to hear, uh, talk to you guys. Um, Hi, Mike. First of all, as I understand it, a deist believes that there's a God that created the universe, and a theist believes that it's a personal God that was hands-on. Well, I'm what we call a double deist. I believe in a very hands-on God. When you talk about double deism, everybody I've told about double Ds either says, <laughs> oh, my God, or what uh, uh, Jesus Christ, okay, as soon as they see him. So that's my proof of the existence of God is in the existence of double Ds. Now my real question is, why in all religions, it seems, is there no humor? If you go through the Bible, the uh, Old Testament, New Testament, the Quran, uh, the Book of Mormon, there's no humor. It seems as though God doesn't like humor. Now, my theory is God is so insecure, he thinks people are laughing at him. Okay? And but he's not paranoid because if he people really are. Therefore, he doesn't like any jokes. Uh, I just wondered what your comments would be on that. You want to go first? Go ahead. Um, I don't even know what to say. I'm not 100% certain that that's true. The, the thing about... Uh, you could take any joke and then say that the fate of your eternal soul lies in uh, not laughing at it and taking it seriously, and mm -hmm. it wouldn't be funny anymore. Um, this, those stories about, like... I'm trying to remember the Mo Moses thing where he's put in a... I can't remember the details of this. There's, there's something about the Moses story where, where he's a little baby and he's put in a basket and the, the Pharaoh asks for some very specific thing to happen and because of the, because of the fact they put Moses in a basket, gonna, he gets away with he was it. Gonna, they killed all the, first, all, the, all the babies under two. Yeah, well, that doesn't strike me as very funny. But, but wait a minute, what's the what's the potential oh. comedy in that? I don't know. You brought you know, it up. I didn't bring it up. Ah, uh, my mistake. But anyway, <laughs> there could be things in the Bible that are meant to be funny. How would you know? Uh, good question. I you think know? I think what may be the case is because there's so little humor in the Bible, the the adherents seem bound and determined to provide the world with humor on behalf of the Bible, which is how you get things like creationist museums where people are riding dinosaurs. Sure, and yet to me it's so easy to come up with humor. Like I was thinking, at the Last Supper, Jesus uh, could have been asked by Judas, uh, what do you think of capital punishment? And Jesus would have said, well, I'm in favor of it, of course. Okay? Which was a little ironic in uh, 
<laughs> light of what was to happen the next day. Yeah, there's the there's the classic joke of of what happened the next day, where Jesus is up on the cross and says, "Hey, Peter, I can see your house from here." <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, but those are all jokes about religion, you, right? There's I think one of, of the reasons, you know, I don't know that this is anything to particularly criticize him for because um, it's not like you find a whole lot of jokes in in anything that's meant to be talking about a serious subject and treating it ser seriously. So I don't. But I don't, yet, to me, humor is the best way to treat serious subjects often because you can't do much about them, so you make a joke about it. Yeah, but but they're making the case that you can do something about them. Is is that's the difference? Okay. Well, it does. It just seems to me that God has uh, very little humor in them, as you can see from uh, many of the acts in the Old Testament. I don't know. Uh, I think you can make a case that, you know, given some of the things that, that, that happen, maybe God has an incredible sense of humor. Uh, and this is all some cosmic joke. He's testing the gullibility of people. Uh, although I wouldn't, particularly <laughs> find it, I wouldn't particularly find it funny uh, as much as just, you know, being a dick. But... Hey, <laughs> yeah, I would have to agree. But it, and also, though, I think it carries over into religious people who also seem to have very little sense of humor. I don't buy that at all. When, they, when they're taking it so seriously that they can't see the other side of it. I, I don't buy that at all. I, I, not remotely. Um, there, e even some of the biggest firebrands you've ever seen, um, I, I find that they do actually have a sense of humor. It, it may not be, you know, they may scoff at, you know, uh, base humor and toilet humor and whatever else, but um, one of the things that you'll notice about preachers, and particularly good preachers, anybody who can get somebody to follow them in something, is that those people tend to have a good sense of humor and use it. You, even in some of the, the most strict, you know, we're going to pound the Bible and, and praise God, oh, you know, the preachers that get up there have a good sense of humor. They use it appropriately within the context of what they're talking about. And, of course, their congregation has to have a sense of good, a good sense of humor. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So I, I, don't, I don't really see okay, the, well, the action. Now, when, when we atheists... get some people to call in with, with some examples of that. Because usually what I find is uh, Christian humorists tell some lame-o, G-rated joke and then say how they got saved, and everybody applauds for the fact that they got saved, but nobody thought the joke was that funny. No, I'll, I'll completely agree with you that I'm not aware of a single, like, you know, Christian stand-up comedian that can make me laugh. And, well, I've, and, I've, and I've tried, but that's when they're specifically trying to, it doesn't mean they don't have a sense of humor, it means that kind of thing doesn't work. I, I'm, I'm saying that, you know... They're probably not, there are Christian stand-up comedians, and yes, they don't make me laugh. Uh, but they're, they're, when, when I, you're, trying, you're saying they don't have a sense of humor, and I'm saying that I completely disagree, because I have yet to go to a church service where the, per, where the person standing up there doing the preaching did not begin with, the, I mean, it's, they're going to begin with a joke, or they're going to include some humorous anecdote that's going to catch people's sense of humor. It's, well, it's, let me, it's let me public speaking 101. Sense, it may be too, how can you disagree? How can you disagree with me, Mike? Humor, I, Mike, humor is, Mike, yes? Mike, how can you possibly disagree with me when I said I have not been to a church where that didn't happen? Well, no. They, uh, they, I'm saying that to me, the basis of humor is a large part being able to see an opposite side of a situation, okay, and the other side of an argument, even. Um, if you're very religious, it's usually because you don't really see the other side. You only see your side. I disagree and the there, other too. The side is just evil. I disagree there, too. They see the other side. They just don't see it in the same way that the other side sees it. Otherwise, they'd agree. We all, we okay. Well, and I don't see I, I, people I think, take, seeing the other side because they're not really responding as though they did. Okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, I think there is. I think there is a point here. I think you're probably overstating it a lot. That uh, that that you know we atheists are have more freedom to play fast and loose with ideas because we're not committed to some um, you know imposed set of beliefs that 
that we're told our, our, the fate of our soul hangs on. That I'll buy. But, and that makes it easier for us. But I, I think, you're, I think that, you're taking it a little too far. I'll buy that there are more opportunities for humor, more subjects in which humor becomes appropriate. But I, I, when you start making broad statements that um, religious people are humorless or have no sense of humor or are, or are incapable, uh, you know, I, I think you've gone way too far. Okay, well, everybody has an opinion, right? <laughs> yeah, and, uh, some of them yeah. are right. All I know is, with my sense of humor, that's what gets me through most of uh, the life's uh, problems, including those with religious people. <laughs> yeah. Okay, dope. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Mike, thanks a lot, man. Yep. Bye -bye. Hey, Mike, one last thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mike would love that. <laughs> <laughs> we got Drew in uh, PA. How you doing? Hey, how's it going, guys? Good. Um, Drew. All right, so uh, when most theists try to get an atheist to believe there's a God, um, most of them think that the atheist doesn't really understand the concept of God, but as you know, most atheists were once believers, or I guess, I don't know, I know Matt was, I don't know about Jeff. Um, yeah, afraid so. Okay. <laughs> but it's like, it's kind of like, Someone that's drunk explaining what being drunk is like to someone who used to be an alcoholic or something like that. I'm stealing that. <laughs> but, um, so I wanted to know uh, how you would explain that to a theist that you once understood the concept of God and where they're at right now. I think um, you just did. What's that? I, I think you just did. Yeah, I... Yeah. I, I um. I mean, I, uh, on this very show, there's a, a video or going around that I watched recently that reminded me of this. Um, I mean, we've had callers that called up that said, oh, you don't believe because you don't understand. And I'd tell them, I do understand. And they didn't, they didn't want to then take that in the direction of testing whether, in fact, I did understand. They were just, no, you don't, no, you don't, no, you don't. And the reason why is, if they admitted that I did, they'd have to admit that it was possible to understand and still not believe. You know, that's just a, it's just a mimetic defense mechanism that you, you deny that the, uh, the theist denies that the unbeliever grasps the concept and then they can happily walk away and say, well, that's why the, the atheist didn't believe with me, didn't agree with me. Okay. Um. Now, that, uh, what I've said before, it depends on who you're talking to because it, this comes up a lot. I mean, people presume that um, atheists simply haven't heard or don't know, and in some cases that's, that's true. I mean, there are some people who, who may not have any familiarity with any religion, having been, you know, raised in, in generations old uh, families of non-believers. Um, and the mo most people you're going to find are at least passingly familiar with religion. I find that most believers are not sufficiently familiar with their religion to even get this subject across. But when somebody likes Ray Comfort, uh, would come up to me and say that I was never a true Christian, um, I agree with him. Because his definition is somebody who uh, knows and does, in fact, have a personal relationship with an existing God. And so my answer is, I agree with you. I was never a true Christian because I was never in that position. However, I was in the position of believing that I was in that position, which right. is the same position that you're in. And we have no way of telling the two apart. We can't tell between the person who simply believes that they are, you know, uh, talking to a god and the person who actually is talking to God. They're indistinguishable to the outside observer. And they're indi seemingly indistingu indistinguishable between each other. So, I don't know. For the people who are really are talking to God, why don't you ever ask him who is and isn't? Let's get a list of who the true Christians are and, sort right. and, and compare lists and get it sorted. That would be handy. Yeah, it would be nice. And um, let me think. Um, that that kind of goes into explaining. Like I know how to just tell somebody like what evidence I looked at to make it or lack thereof for why I don't believe in their God. But I can't really go through my own like transitional forms in my own mind, like going from a, like a theist to a deist, and then not thinking there's any re reason to believe at all. Why can't you? Um, I just I just don't know how to explain it to someone who's a believer, ah. like going through the transitional phases. Yeah, I don't know that I'm but, I'm particularly yeah. good at that either. But but, but uh, it, again, for a lot of for a lot of believers, um, it, it, they will take your not uh, your, your lack of belief with uh, <coughs> as proof that you don't understand. 
So there's no way to get past that. You're just going to be stuck staring at that person and them smugly thinking that they've won. Okay. Sorry, I, I, I oh. wish I wish that, that you know um, I wish that all these discussions were really fair and open and honest on both sides, but they're not. Right. All right. Well, thanks for taking my call, guys. Sure. Thanks, Drew. All right. I'll see you. All right. We've got Denise in Portland. How are you? Good. How are you? We're doing well. Hi, Denise. What's up? Um. Well, I'm on a Facebook. It's called the Holy Bible Page, and one of the atheists kind of challenged us to call in, so I did. And oh. I am a Christian and make no bones about it. Okay. okay. And what can we do for you? I don't know, just called in the chat. Um, about anything in particular? No. Well, you know, it's really disheartening how many of the atheists are former believers, and I realize that. But I don't think they realize what's going to happen to them in the end. I think I mean, you're right. You know, I don't think any I of us know what's going to happen in to us. I'm literal hell. I'm sorry? And where are they going to end up when they die? You, I mean, I'll just have be quiet. you thought about it? But, uh, what, you, you say you believe in a liter literal hell? Yes, I do. And you think that we atheists deserve to go there? No. We don't? I don't, I don't then want how to see come, anybody go. Then how but come, then how come just, you... Ma'am? Yeah, Denise? go ahead. So if you, you believe there's a hell, and yep. you believe the atheists are going to go there, because yep. why? Your God's going to send us there, right? No. They no? send themselves there by no, 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 Jesus no. No, 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 Then no, that's yeah, silly. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's silly. I'm choosing it's right now, silly. I don't want to go to hell. Okay? You so now your God has the option of either sending me or not. Jesus has thrown you a life preserver. That's why he's called the Savior. Uh, Ma'am? You guys have been ridiculous enough to reject it. Where did, where did hell come from? It's in the Bible. He spoke about it many times. I believe in it. If you don't... No, no, no. no. I, Denise, I'm just asking a question. Did God create hell? Well, actually, God originally created hell for Satan and his demons. We sure. weren't supposed to go there. Sure. So what, what determination was there in your religion? Why, why did God decide to start sending people to hell? I mean, you don't Again, think... Again, he doesn't send them to hell. You guys send yourselves. Okay. Uh, we don't. That's nonsense. Yeah, we have the choice. Is. We have the choice. We choose not to go. Now, your God is back. The ball's back in his court. If he wants to send us, he can. Is he going to? You send yourselves. I no, we don't. That's ridiculous. You send yourself. No, he that's ridiculous, ma'am. Here's the thing, Denise. It doesn't matter how many times you keep repeating this. I'm trying well, to... Well, you keep repeating your stuff. That I, I'm, let, me, let me try something. I tried something else, which was, did God create hell? If so, then he's ultimately responsible for it, correct? Does he not make the rules? Do things not As happen? I said, that do, was Denise, 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 do things not happen according to your God's will? Does he not already know? He's everybody's God. You keep referring to him as my God. He's everyone's no, God. He's not my God. I don't even believe he exists. But in any case, I don't care whether... In any case, I don't care how you pretend label. I'm trying to get to the, to the source of the problem here. And, it, and it's this. Because you, you, you were saying, you know, Jesus threw, threw you a life preserver. As far as I'm concerned, um, within the bounds of your theology, Jesus kicked me overboard. Because you, you believe... He kick you overboard. You, you sure he did. Him. May I? Sure he did. Because, I, and hang on. Okay. Did your God create hell? Yes she or said, no? She said yes. Yes. Okay. Did your God create the rules of the universe, including the criteria by which souls are judged? Yes. It, does anything happen that doesn't go according to your God's will? No. Then your God is ultimately responsible for everything, including the people who he sends to hell. So messed up. I mean, yeah, that, that logic <laughs> yes, stuff. It is, it's a it real pain in the ass, isn't it? It is messed up, ma'am. And when you reject him, that's the dumbest thing you could possibly do. That's why he's called the Savior. And, and I have a question. Go ahead. What are we being yep. saved? What are you being? What are we being saved from exactly? You're being saved from eternal damnation. But well, hell. Um, hell. Have you ever been a Christian? Yes, I was. For how many years? Oh, till I was about 21, 22. What happened? Uh, 
We understand. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I thought about whether there was any reason to believe any of that stuff, and uh, I f and it and it scared me because I had been raised to believe in a you know a kind and loving God, but you know to fear this kind and loving God, and so every time it it, it occurred to me to question that my fear got in the way. Eventually, I said to myself, you know. If God is really kind and loving, he's not going to mind me using my brain, the brain that he gave me, to think clearly, carefully, and rationally about the stuff that I've been taught and to make my own decision. And the moment that I realized a kind and loving God would not, uh, is, it was not to be feared uh, when, I, when I'm considering you know, rethinking my beliefs, that gave me the freedom to think clearly about my beliefs. And within a minute, I realized this is all nonsense. I'm an atheist. And, and I'll actually go one step further here. And, and even if I were to concede your, your, what I consider to be a ridiculous framing that God doesn't send people to hell, people to send, send themselves to hell, even if I were to accept that, um, I won't even necessarily go to the mafia boss analogy that I think is completely valid. Um, my, my point of view is this. You have a, a being, according to your theology, that can possibly prevent people from having to suffer eternally. And he has, instead of being good and just and caring and actually doing that, is offering a kind of bribe. And the bribe is, you need to believe without evidence, and you need to worship and adhere and follow my commands. That's not love. That is oh, not. That is not. Here, that right. is not love. That is not an uh, exercise of love. That is not. A, save you. I mean, he went through. He hell didn't die. You. Hey, do he you not? Wait. The one that paid the price. Da if Denise. Denise. Him, you know. Denise. That's their decision. Right. Then why the fuck did you call? Excuse me. I. I. I you just. You can't be a lot more civil to someone that calls in without using filthy language. Filthy what? language. Well, hang on. First of all, you called to tell this us. This conversation is over. God bless you. I hope all of you see the light. He is the only way. Are you, Goodbye. Are you done? Oh. Yeah, she's hanging up. Now. I used a word that Denise hurt her feelings. Hey, it, it doesn't surprise me. And um, while we'll have to put a little disclaimer on this particular issue, it doesn't surprise me that somebody who is so muddled in their thinking and is so afraid of the irrational would give magic powers to words. Guess what? It's four letters. It's phonemes. They don't have any magical powers. It's a way of expressing an exclamation mark. You called. And then when things got too heated, you tried to do this, well, it's all up to you guys, and if you reject him, that's your responsibility, etc., which was your way of giving up. All you wanted to do was call in and state your opinion and move on. So when I ask, why the fuck did you call, I wasn't cursing you out. I was exclaiming that this is absurd for you to call in and do this. To call in and pretend like you're going to defend your beliefs, and then when they're challenged directly to a point that you can't defend them, you, you cry that your feelings got hurt because somebody used a word that was scary. It's no wonder that you are still stuck in this mindset of being afraid of fantasy if one little word sends you screaming off of, oh, the poor atheists, they're beating up on me and they're saying offensive things. Can, can we spend a little time on this whole thing of we send ourselves to hell? Yeah. Please. That's that is okay. I'm I'm holding it's a I'm holding a gun to your head, yeah. Telling you to give me a hundred dollars. Don't make me shoot you. Yeah. That's what it is. It's that exactly is what that. that that's what that arrangement is. No, that is if Matt refuses to give me a hundred dollars, he did not commit suicide. It's why I've used the mafia boss analogy before, because it's why I asked if you thought your God created hell. Because the mafia boss creates the scenario where, A, we can protect you from this stuff, but you've got to be making payments. <laughs> uh, and yeah. when somebody comes along to break my thumbs for not making payments, that wasn't my choice. I mean, you're saying that my choice is to make those payments or get my ass kicked. And in your theology, my choice is to uh, accept something that my brain can't possibly accept because it's irrational and without evidence, and then go the step further of becoming worshipful and adherent to this fantasy. Well, I won't do it. 
because I see what happens when people do become worshipful and adherent to that fantasy. Even if I could convince myself to, to go ahead and accept the delusion, it is harmful and it is immoral and your theology is immoral. And what you are saying about there being a literal hell and that God gets to wash his hands of the, it's all completely immoral. You have lost your own sense of dignity, self-respect, humanity, and morality. I loved how you laid out the, the logical chain connecting God with responsibility for people going to hell. And she goes, that's fucked up. Yeah, well, she didn't say, she wouldn't say that. Oh, right, that's messed up, she said. All right, so now, um, now and it is three F-bombs. It, it sure is messed up, ma'am. And, and yet, it wasn't Matt's chain of logic that was messed up. It was the fact that you're in a religion where that chain of logic can easily be drawn and, uh, and you just avoid it. <sighs> I'm surprised she didn't come down with the vapors. Amazing. I'm sorry that I offended your Victorian sense of morality or immorality, uh, but some of us live in the real word, world and aren't afraid of a couple words on occasion. However, if Denise wants to call back, I promise I won't drop another F-bomb while telling her what an idiot she's being about her thinking on these subjects. And that doesn't mean I think she's stupid across the board. That We've had lots of discussions about this, you know, don't be a dick type thing. Um, <sighs> but I, when I say that somebody's stupid, guess what? I'm stupid. Jeff's stupid. The people in the audience hey. are stupid. We are all <laughs> stupid at some time about something. Yeah. The difference is that some of us, when we have this pointed out to us, or when we recognize it in ourselves, strive to overcome it. We say, you know what? I was being stupid. Let's correct that so that I'm not stupid about other things. And other people say, I'm not stupid. They deny. It's this, it's this massive ego that prevents them from denying, from accepting that they too can be wrong, that they too can make stupid mistakes. And that is what makes they take offense to this. Oh, you called me stupid. You called, yeah, I did. Get over it. Call me stupid back. We've both been stupid about something. When you have that sort of reaction to somebody telling you that your beliefs on a certain subject are stupid or that you're being an idiot about something in particular, first of all, they're most likely not summing up your entire character. They're most likely not saying you are a complete useless brain that can't do anything right. They are talking within the context of that subject. If your initial reaction is to simply take offense and shut down the conversation, that's ego. It's not logic. You didn't win. You don't have any high ground, intellectual, moral, or otherwise. It's ego. It is your own inner self saying, I couldn't possibly be wrong. How dare you challenge me? And it's no different than making up nonsense crap about somebody using the F word or whatever. It's a way of avoiding the actual discussion. It's a way of avoiding the intellectual honesty that goes where the logic leads instead of saying, that's messed up once you've been proven wrong. It really is that simple. I hope we're going to get more of these people from that Facebook page that I got challenged too. to call, us, call into yeah, the all show. You people and from the I, Holy and I hope the page. rest of them will be maybe, oh, not a little tipsy when they call. Yeah. But Kevin in Lincoln, UK, how are you? Hi, how's it going? Good. Cheers. Um, sorry about the tipsy comment. I've had a few beers, so I might be a bit tipsy. <laughs> All right. Um, right, well, I love the show. Um, the last call was hilarious, by the way. Thank you. Um, and and thank you, Denise. Is, um, what's your opinion on um, in the God we trust on your money? I think it should be removed, but I don't think it's ever likely to be removed. Well, I was just wondering, what's the the point in like arguing like trying to get that removed because in the UK we have God Save the Queen. So You're also not a secular nation. Um, I know we're not a secular nation. We well, are. Oh, wait yeah. a second. Um, are we? What? Well, <laughs> it, it, in, it, you are becoming more, in a, but you have an official organized church as your, your state church. And oh, so, yeah, the and so yeah. there's not necessarily a conflict there, whereas we live in a nation that was founded on secular principles and about uh, 60 years ago or so, some people decided that they wanted to inject God in everything. In God We Trust was not always on the money. This happened in 1954 when it was it became the official motto and was then added to all the paper money in 1956. Um, it had occurred on some money along with a lot of other potential mottos. Um, but th the reason we're, we're objecting to it is because this is a change. It is a, is a particularly... Um, uh, insidious change because it goes unnoticed. I have literally had people tell me that, that their proof that this is a Christian nation is that in God we trust is on the money. And it demonstrates that not only do they not know how this came about, they don't understand why it was wrong in the first place. So in your case, you don't really have any grounds to say, you know, get God save the queen off the money. 
um, and you guys are a lot more laid back about it in general. In our case, we used to have it the right way, and now we have it wrong because of some reactionary extremists um, who took over right. amidst some extremely, some very, very silent uh, non-theists. Hmm. But so. it's not the sort of issue that I tend to fight a lot. I mean, you know, it's not like I'm saying we should go out and have court cases all the time because, quite frankly, I don't care what they, what they print on there. It's irrelevant to the point. Uh, but it, it's something that I think you object to on principle, but you don't necessarily go have a court case every day about it. All right. Uh, maybe in that case, then, you should try and make uh, America become a Christian nation because the U.K. is definitely a lot more atheistic than your country. I, and, I, do, uh, I do have a personal theory that... Um, that the way to uh, to um, uh, to tame a religion is to make it a state institution, because that appears to be what uh, the, there an argument can be made that that's what happened in Europe and the UK. And lots of people have made that part that argument that that it stifles competition. That right. we have fostered a society in which religion is is free to compete with other religions, and and where they have to work hard if they're going to make money. And so they do, and that's the problem. Um, and and competing religions, ones that don't get state support, are uh, are not able to compete because they don't get the free money from the state. So, uh, right. uh, arguably, that uh, that is a, could be a better way to do things. It's just um, uh, it it, might it's work. very distasteful for us over here, you know, to uh, to contemplate doing that out of just a purely practical. Uh, it may uh, be goal, very knowing that knowing that we're not supposed to be a, a religious um, a religious government. It may be it a, could, a go ahead. It could be quite funny, like watching the fundies uh, like get their way and have you know America become an officially a Christian nation. They uh, to shoot themselves in the foot and uh, end up more atheists and uh, non-believers throughout the whole country. Yeah, it, it, they it sure may... wouldn't be supported by the Republicans over here anymore. They'd be saying, "Hey, that's a wasteful government expense." It may turn out to be a very effective way of getting rid of religion, but it's not the way that I'd want to go um, because it's wrong. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it may be a very effective way to cure athlete's foot by taking a scythe and cutting off your, your foot, uh, <laughs> but it's not what I would consider to be the preferred solution. A little Blackadder reference for you, just in case. Okay. Oh, good old Blackadder. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Kevin. Kevin. It's been great, John. Bye. Bye bye. There, yeah, there's a, an episode of Black Ladder where they're talking about someone who is particularly clever, and yeah. somebody says, you, you know, you be careful being that, getting that many good ideas, your foot might fall off. Uh -huh. Does that happen? Yeah, well, yeah, I had a cousin who had the bright idea of cutting his toenails with a scythe, and his foot fell off. So. All right, we've got, is it Tan in Atlanta or Tan? Yeah, it's Tan. Tan. Hey, Tan. Hey, um, recently I was watching uh, Science Channel and a show called Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman is coming on. Have you guys ever seen that? I haven't watched it yet, but a lot of people have told me about it. Uh, yes, I was watching it, and the first episode was about if there is a creator of the universe or not. And a guy named Prof uh, Professor Michael Persinger from uh, Laurentian University, he created something called the God Helmet. Yeah. And what it is, it's like a, it's a helmet, and then it delivers like... Um, electromagnetic signals to different parts of your brain yep. and it activates supposed parts that create a divine experience for you uh -huh. and up and uh, up to 80 percent of people that like took it uh, even atheists and religious people both they both said they saw something some some sort of outside presence like a god or a demon or something divine near them even though sure. they're atheists or religious right it provokes an experience that is ubiquitously labeled with this sort of religious language yeah yeah, and uh, he also said that maybe uh, someone like Christ or Muhammad, this could be uh, also, like, the experience could also be created through maybe a lightning storm or maybe use of, like, drugs or psychedelics or something like that. So I thought that was pretty cool sure. to share that. And there's been speculation that people who've had religious vision suffer from things like uh, temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, yeah. And also, um, like V.S. Ramachandran, who probably one of those brilliant people who's ever walked the earth, um, has done studies with people with uh, uh, split brain phenomena where the, the uh, corpus callosum has been uh, separated, I believe. I might, might have got the term wrong. But anyway, you end up yeah. with two, two separate personalities, and they can actually communicate with both of them because only one of them can actually use uh, speech. 
The other one is going to control an arm. And so you can communicate with both of these two halves of one person's brain that have individual personalities that will answer questions in different ways, including in one case where one side of the brain said it believed in a god and the other side of the brain said it didn't believe in a god. And while this is the sort of thing that um, he has said, and I completely agree, should have sh sent shockwaves through the religious community, it's gone largely ignored and unnoticed. And the fact yeah, of the I mean, matter that is... Makes sense. Uh, and uh, about that study, I was actually, uh, I'm taking psychology in school right now, and we were learning about that study, and what happened was when they split the brain, they showed an image to one side of the screen and another side of the screen, and then when they showed it to the right side, the person could not, he knew what it was, but he couldn't, like, verbalize it. And the same thing happened with this uh, God helmet, because they sent pulses to the uh, right side of the brain, and the left side of the brain had to interpret it, and the first thing they could come up with was it was divine. Yeah, and they did something similar on uh, uh, an episode of House in season five. The big thing is that when we, when we talk about both religious experience and when we talk about things like the soul, all the attributes that we would normally attribute to a soul or religious experience can be identified through normal brain activity with a handful of exceptions. And those exceptions tend to fall in the category where nothing real, no real phenomena has been demonstrated. For example, people will say the soul is the thing that, it, that pers the, the part of us that persists after we die. Well, obviously there's, there's no reason to think that that even occurs. That's just, you know, something that somebody's posited and glommed onto it. When you talk about personality and preferences and beliefs and passions and all these things, they're identifiable in the brain. And by studying people with abnormal brains, um, we're, we're getting better and better at identifying it. And the fact that we don't understand everything about the brain um, seems to leave open some room for mystery that, that religious people still want to work in. But what I find fascinating is they don't need to. They just ignore. Right. Uh, they ignore what we find out about the brain and say, nope, that's the soul. Nope, that's the soul. Yeah, I've dealt with many people like that yet. You guys are really helped me out and stuff with even talking to religious people because I used to even, I used to get real angry and stuff, but then now I'm just like, you know, I'll let it go because there's no changing people like that, you know? Well, there, um, don't give up. I mean, there, the, the, Matt and I both used to be theists. So yeah. there is changing people like that. It just, you don't know um, that in any particular argument that you're dealing with somebody who's going to be able to, um, to uh, understand your arguments. And there are people and who... There may be people that, that, that won't ever change their mind, but you don't know which ones they are. Yeah, and, yeah you know, that's the, true. But, but anyway, um, the, the point is, uh, you, you're... You know, we atheists have a valid point of view, and um, we shouldn't just shut up about it because we're not going to be able to change the opinions of the believers either. I mean, we're all entitled to not only have our own opinions, but to say what they are. Yeah. And, and yeah. one last thing is that there are people who have called into the show four or five years ago during, you know, my first year or two on the show, um, who called in several times, had, were some of the, the most staunch believers um, who we got into heated conversations and debates about all of this. Um, and I never had any interest in particularly changing that person's mind. My reason for doing the, having that conversation is because there are other people watching. There are people at different stages of belief and different positions in this broad spectrum of, and, and considering the arguments. And so I wanted to present them as best I could. And I have received email from some of those people um, who said, you know, I used to call your show and give you a hard time two or three years ago, and, but I kept watching anyway, and now I'm an atheist. So you never know. You never know what's going to happen. Yeah, that's, yeah. All right, well, I won't waste any more time. I know there's a lot of people on the line, so thanks a lot for taking my call. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate right, it. Bye. Yeah, I don't think there's any real likelihood that, for example, I'm going to change my parents' mind or my grandparents' mind or most of my family members' mind. And, and so I don't specifically try. It's not that I, we, we have an understanding. They know what I believe and what they believe. Um, they know that I'm not going to shut up anymore and sit over in the corner while they talk religious nonsense. Um, although on occasion, I'll just ignore the conversation. But on occasion, I'll chime in mm -hmm. um, because that's the way it works. I don't think I'll ever change any of their minds. But I could be wrong. Right. So. 
As a reminder, since it's been a little bit, after the show's over, we get together and go to dinner at Threadgill's, 301 West Riverside Drive. Any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to come down and join us. Um, if you don't make it through on the telephone today or if you don't want to, you can email tv at atheist-community.org and you can tell me what an unbelievably arrogant ass I am and how I shouldn't be using profanity. I can't believe you dropped stupid. the F-bomb on that lady. I know. You, you dick. I know. <laughs> what was I thinking? All right. And actually, it's getting to the point where, well, never mind. Did you see, there's a, there's a really great uh, video that I found on YouTube with, um, oh gosh, now of course his name is going to escape me, uh, um, used to be comedy partner of the guy who plays House. Oh, Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry talking about yeah, it's swearing. It's, it's a great little video. It's absolutely brilliant. And, and it's, I already favored it, and I'll probably be posting it on Facebook now that you've reminded me. Hmm. Yeah. And, and believe me, Stephen Fry knows every fucking thing there is to know about the proper use of profanity. <laughs> if somebody flagged this episode <laughs> just, just, just for the repeats. Uh, Jonathan in Columbia, how are you? Hi, fine, thank you. I like cursing, by the way, so don't feel too bad. Well, right. we, we do try to limit it, but it's become kind of a meta discussion today. So I'll, I'll ask that we make attempts to limit it so that the show's at least approachable by most people. Well, I, well I, I won't curse, so, so what's I up? Just wanted to know if um, you guys, despite being atheists, I'm one myself, if you ever rely on things that are irrational just to feel, to feel okay or have comfort, and I'll, and I'll tell you why I'm asking. I'm, I'm Jamaican. I was watching the Miss Universe pageant last week, and Jamaica was a favorite. We got to the final two, which was Jamaica and Mexico, and in, in, in the pageant world, they believe, if, they believe two things. If in the last two you're standing on the right, chances are you're going to win. And also, if you are called first into, into the top five, chances are you're going to lose. So I'm sitting there, my heart is pounding hard, heavy, and I'm looking at the Jamaicans on the right-hand side, so that's one. And they call the other contestant first, so that's two. And I felt my heart slow down, and it was very noticeable, and I really did feel better. By the end of the night make a loss, so clearly that wasn't, you know, rational for me to think in the first place, but it did make me feel better. My heart rate did slow down, I did feel a bit better, so my question to you guys is, is there ever a time when those things happen to you? You know it's, you know it's not rational, but it makes it feel better. Sure, of course. Yeah. And when I catch myself doing it, I try to stop. Me too. <laughs> yeah, the other thing is, what you're talking about may not necessarily be irrational. Um, yeah. It may be that we don't have evidence to support it, but it's possible that the positioning or the order of name calling um, actually represents some subconscious bias. And you know, we we already know, for example, guys guys in the magic world know that um, if you put down a handful of cards in a particular order, we can predict with a pretty high degree of certainty which one's going to get picked based on its position and its value color with respect to others. For example, if, if you people don't tend to go for the ends or the middle as much as they do tend to go for one off. And it's because of what's actually taking place. It's because I'm trying to trick you and you know I'm trying to trick you and on some level you want to uh, participate and on some level you want to counteract that so you don't necessarily go for the obvious. So there are subtle little psychological things like that that may betray a trend that would then be relevant to that. My thing is, I agree with Jeff, um, there may, in fact, be irrational things like that that I occasionally uh, depend on, but the second I realize that I'm doing it, I attempt to correct myself. And I think that's one of the things that, that we use to identify um, good skeptics. Yeah. I mean, we're evolved to be pattern recognition machines, and the, uh, the, the, the downside is there's a lot of things that seem like patterns that aren't necessarily all that significant, but our brains react to them anyway. You know, so you have to you have to educate yourself in how to tell the difference between things that are that are patterns that are likely to actually be be relevant and patterns that aren't. And and then you you know. Well, not not that he not that he he he, he says that because I, I watch patterns all the time, and as far as this universe goes, we we always realize that the person who ends up winning is either called in the 
in the second position in the final five or in the top 15, they're out in the first five or the last five. The girls in the middle never end up winning. It uh -huh. just never happens that way. Okay. Well, I, obviously I don't have the data in front of me. I'm sure somebody dug through the data and made this public that, it, that all of a sudden the, <laughs> the Miss Universe pageant might notice this and change the way but, they're doing it. But things. unless you know of a mechanism that causes it yeah. to be that way, you know, uh, uh, something about the way the rules are right. structured, or the way the, 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 the process is carried on uh, that, that results in that outcome, it could be just coincidence that so far that is how it has happened. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. So. Well, that was my question. All right, thanks, cool. John. Thank you guys for listening. Thanks, right. Jonathan. Thanks very much. Have a good day. Bye. You too. All right, we've got Bet right here in Austin. Hello? Hey, guys. Hey. Oh, it's uh, Brett. They typoed it. I'm sorry. Yeah, Hi. it's Brett. Hi, Brett. How you doing? What's up? Turn that down. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah you want to turn the TV, the TV down because there's a delay. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the Denise that called earlier, I think there was a really good opportunity. What she said, uh, what you guys were talking about, um, the creation of hell and God being responsible um, for everyone who sins there. That's a great opportunity for a flow chart. I'd like to see that all in uh, large, bold print that you could follow it down, and, and uh, it, I think it'd be really persuasive. But, but uh, when you were talking to her, you also uh, said that um, these beliefs are immoral and, and uh, lots of other uh, things. And, you know, the argument is, well, if I believe this way all my life and all I do is good things from it, and uh, what's the harm if I was wrong in the end? What's can, you, uh, can you expand on that? Sure. You want to go? Sure. Um, it, 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 you know, if you have an immoral belief, but just, ne I mean, if, uh, if you think it's okay to punch uh, Spanish people in the face and uh, you never meet one, you can get through life without ever having done anything bad. And, uh, but then if you say, well, what was the harm? You're missing the point. Right? I mean, that is a, was a bad thing to believe in the first place. And I think that's the kind of thing that, that Matt was talking about. And now back to you, because I don't actually know for sure what you were talking about. Well, what, what exactly, what, what, what specific immoral things about the whole hell thing were you referencing? One of the issues with this, it depends on specifically what it is that people believe. But by and large, when I hear the, the what's the harm thing, any number of answers come up. Um, depending on the specific beliefs, there are, of course, believers who obviously do uh, things that they shouldn't, like avoiding hospitals and blood transfusions and, and opting for prayer instead of actual medical treatment. And then there are other believers um, who simply, uh, you know, go through life and they have these beliefs, but they don't necessarily act on them to the same extent. So their idea is that, well, if I get to the end, you know, it's not, my belief in God doesn't affect my daily life or do anything else like that. So if I get to the end and die and I turn out to have been wrong, I've lost nothing. Um, it's, it's a take on Pascal's wager that is horribly, horribly flawed because what you've lost is the opportunity for truth. Yeah. Uh, may I? Um, yeah, the, uh, uh, we've sort of gotten off specifically the subject of hell now, but uh, on the, the, the whole idea that, that the, the, pro the person who believes that uh, whether their morality is rational or not, as long as they only did good things, you know, what was the harm? Well, if their morality was irrational, likely they did do bad things. They just weren't able to recognize it. If, if your understanding of morality is how you make those decisions, and if your idea of morality is, well, all, you, what you're supposed to do is obey this set of rules that you got from your religion, without having any, any uh, understanding or concern for the actual implications of, uh, you know, or actual con consequences of following those rules, <coughs> then you get through life and think that you are a great guy and not have been. Yeah. I, I think there's... The way I'd kind of phrase it is this. Um, our brains are complex and we don't completely understand them. While some people are really good at compartmentalizing specific beliefs and keeping them separate from other things, um, particularly when you start talking about um, theists who are also scientists who, who would apply the scientific method and try to be rational about things, um, even in the theist-slash-skeptic theist community there. The fact of the matter is that our brains take into consideration everything. 
and every belief we have either directly or indirectly affects every other belief we have to some degree. And that may be negligible in some cases, but why, first of all, why risk it? And second of all, um, I don't think that what's the harm is a particularly good argument for holding an irrational belief. So I am of the opinion that I'd like to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible because I understand that every false belief that I have, even if I'm not immediately aware of all the potential harm, it's something that can affect all my other beliefs. And in the case of religious people, many of them are not just holding these beliefs, they're actively promoting these beliefs in others. And if you have a belief that you don't have a particularly good reason for, and your best reason for not giving it up is that you don't presently see the harm in it, and yet you go and promote that belief to others, I think you're taking an immoral action. I think you are promoting something as true that you don't necessarily have any good reason to believe is true, and you haven't yet identified the harm, but you're willing to pass this meme along um, even though you know that it could potentially be harmful. When we talk about the idea that we are all reprobate sinners who send ourselves to hell and we, um, we can avoid this by latching on to some fictitious uh, life preserver being tossed to us by some fantasy guy who supposedly died for a weekend, um, I think it's really kind of absurd to say that believing that has no effect on anything else in your life. I think, I think it's a naive statement to presume that one could believe something so profound about the human nature at its base and the way the cosmos works and that it doesn't affect any other decisions. I think more accurately, people have blinders on to the harm. And there's a website, I think it's whatstheharm.net, that it will actually go through and quantify some of the harm that's being done. Um, and we've seen this in other areas too, where people have been convinced that they're not only not doing harm, but they're avoiding harm. In the anti-vax movement, for example, right. where they have been convinced that vaccinating their kids is going to be harmful. And so they take this action and their argument is not, okay, what's the harm if I don't vaccinate my kids? Their argument is that they're doing the absolute right thing, which is similar to what religious believers would, would have you believe. And the fact of the matter is they're absolutely wrong and they are freaking killing people. And we're seeing uh -huh. epidemics of whooping cough and other things because they have failed to uphold their duty as you know good citizens. Oh, well, it's my right. I don't have to vaccinate my kids if I don't want to. And I shouldn't have to take that risk. Well, thank you for screwing the rest of us over and killing off herd immunity, you selfish pricks. And by the way, you're probably killing your kids you're probably doing harm. So they're not, you know, there are plenty of people who can run around and say, what's the harm where we haven't necessarily identified it, but there are also people doing it, not only what's the harm, but I'm not doing harm when there's clear identifiable harm. So yeah. I what, think that the, the moral, the, the right position is to try and avoid false beliefs as much as possible. Right, what's the harm is really not the issue, yeah. right? Is it true is the issue. Because if, if uh, you know, if you uh, have a belief and the belief is accurate, right, um, then there may be consequences of you having that belief. That belief may affect your behavior, but at least that you're taking the, you're taking the actions that are driven by an accurate understanding of reality. If you're believing something that's not true, it's still going to drive your actions, but now it's, you know, it, it's just an irresponsible thing to latch on to in the first place. You know, I have exactly one thing you could call a belief that I know can't be proved even in theory. Uh, and uh, in addition to a number of things that I, I you know, I, I think the evidence supports them, I believe those things, right, on which I can be wrong. But I know of exactly one belief I have that, uh, that, I, that I'm, I'm just latching on to for convenience sake, and that is that all of this is not just a big illusion. And that, and I, I, and I'm completely upfront about the fact that I can't, I can't prove that to myself or anybody else, and uh, and I'm, I'm latching onto it only because, absent that belief, everything seems kind of pointless, and that doesn't sound like a good way to live. But, uh, but even on that one, I would love to be proved wrong. I'd love to be shown a way to determine whether everything is just an illusion. And I'd certainly be the first to amend my, uh, my view of reality if it was proved to me that everything was an illusion. You know? But 
it, that's it's it's what Matt was saying. The 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 goal in life should be to uh, to find out what's actually true, and go with that. Are you there? I guess I lost him. We talked Brett right off the air. Sorry, Brett. You got the two biggest talkers, so I'm sorry we we kind of went overboard on that. Anyway. So. It's 5.30 here in Austin, Texas, August 29, 2010. We're still taking calls. We're going to take live calls right up till the end of the show. And you can join us for dinner at around 6.30 or so at Thread Gills at 301 West Riverside. There are at least, oh, lines are full again. So okay. do you have anything to add? Or I do don't. Let's, Let's move, move on. on. Yeah. We've got Lupo in Akron. Hello, yes. Hi, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. How about you guys? Pretty good. Uh, yeah, I just want to quickly talk about uh, hell, since that seems to be the big topic now, isn't it? If you like, go ahead. Um, Are you I for it or against? I don't know if a lot of people realize this, but hell has been found, but not in the matter of what a lot of people think. Hell was a garbage dump in ancient Jerusalem outside the city where they would burn garbage, and that's where the lepers lived. And Actually, lepers I don't were known think to be the biggest sinners. That, so that therefore, didn't... one of several words in there the Bible go. that have been translated as hell does map to what you're talking about. Um, it's I, I'm not going to go into it in great detail because I'm not you know in a particular mood for that today. But it is uh, it's an oversimplification to do this. Hell has been found, and it's this dump. No, that's not the case. Sorry, Lupo. You can actually um, you can actually go watch my my visions of hell lecture online, which includes pictures of hell and actually talks about the different Bible words that are translated as hell, whether it's Hades or Gehenna, et cetera, and and it covers that. Go ahead. Um and yes, it seems like other people are talking about morality too. So do you believe that humans are either inherently good or bad? No. They're inherently human. So there is no inherent morality? Correct. Okay. I like the I'm, questions I can answer easily. <laughs> do, and, you, um, do you think there is? My, are, we, are, we, are, are we disagreeing with you on something that you feel very strongly about? If so, say so. Uh, no, you're not. You're actually pretty much agreeing with me in okay. every point. And, um, Sorry. <laughs> which makes for a really boring television, but keep going. And I have one last question that is, um, I, I, I have been back watching a lot of episodes of the show and a lot of different calls and everything, and I have been listening to like where you come from with your atheism and everything, and uh, I don't know if you could expand on that for me or something. I'm on, not quite sure what you're asking. Yeah, on what in particular? Like, I guess a better explanation of why you're atheist? Because we want to believe as many true things and as few false things as we can, and as far as we can tell, the proposition that there is a God is, uh, is not sufficiently uh, demonstrated to justify belief. Okay, and how are you defining God in this point? Uh, uh, most, what, we, what I just said will apply to most of the major definitions of what a God is. Obviously, though, if somebody, like an example I like to use is if I'm on a South Seas island and they've got a totem pole and they, they, that they worship and they say that's their God, well, I can go rap on that thing with my knuckles and, and know that it exists, but that's not what most people mean. We're, we're talking about about the Christian God, the Jewish God, Allah, um, those kinds of gods. I mean, generally, I, I, I don't make any kind of claim that way at all. I don't define a God. If I'm having a conversation with somebody who says they believe in a God, I want them to tell me what it is that they believe in, and then I'll let them know whether or not I believe in it and why. Um, because there, there are people, but I, I agree with Jeff. Um, there are definitions of God or there are usages of God um, that are not only more common but more valuable. In order for us to communicate effectively, I'd like us to have kind of an economy of language and, and we'd, we would, it would be very nice if we could 
um, not conflate terms, which is why the word spiritual just drives me bonkers because it's absolutely meaningless. It means a million different things to a million different people, and it's usually used as an excuse for conveying meaning rather than as an intent to convey meaning. And God is often the same way, but I would say that God as a label typically conveys along with it some baggage, so that if somebody says this totem pole is God, or this coffee cup is God, okay, clearly we're talking about an existing object, but this coffee cup, um, which doesn't have coffee in it, is it's water, um, has a name already. It's like when people say the universe is God, or God is love. Well, no, the universe already has a label, it's universe, and love already has a label, it's love. So you are clearly trying to add something to it with this God label, but you're not explaining what it is that you're adding to it. And until you do, I'm fine with saying, okay, I accept that, you know, the universe exists, but I don't accept your additional baggage that you're trying to tie onto it with the God label. Right. Like with the South Seas Islanders, I might, I might have to, uh, you know, I, might, I would happily agree that their God exists, but if they then tell me that it controls the weather, um, I, I may well disagree with them on that point. Okay? Yes, and um, I love philosophy. I'm a big philosophy student, even though I'm only in high school, but I'm taking, I've taken philosophy classes and I've studied it a lot on my own and everything. And I have a book open here by, uh, it's The Story of Philosophy by Will Durant, and I'm going to quote this here. And it says, For nothing is so difficult as definition, nor anything so severe a test and exercise of mental clarity and skill. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if he's right, <laughs> but I like it. Definition is, <laughs> definition is I, I think there may be some things that are more difficult, but I'm not going to you know, get pedantic and, and pick at somebody else's quote. But thanks, Lupo. Yep, thank you, guys. We've got Andy here in Austin. How are you? All right. How are you guys? Pretty good. Good, Andy. Good. I got a, a couple things to discuss with you, and actually a theist atheist joke for you, since uh, humor was one of the earlier subjects. Uh -huh. but, um, so anyway, one of them is just my general frustration with theist arguments that they seem to fall into two different categories. Um, one is, and I heard a couple on this show, is you know the Bible is true, and I can take out the Bible and read you the verse that shows you it's true. Yeah. It is kind of like, well, I want someone to tell me that so I can say, well, we're flying all over the galaxy fighting aliens, and I'm going to put it in this Star Trek DVD and show you that it's true. You know, and, it, you know, and it's a DVD and you're watching it, it must be true. So um, that's a frustration I have with that. And I think it's just kind of an uneducated kind of uh, way of, of saying that I'm a theist and this is why it's true. Um, and, and people are in church and other places, you know, told to do that and told to believe, and this is why. Yeah, there's um, dependence but, on authority. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the second one is um, that there seems to be a great reliance for the more educated theists on the structure of argument. And I understand the reasons that you, we really need to have a good structured argument. You need to be able to look at the logical inconsistencies. And if someone throws out a syllogism, you need to say, well, that's not a syllogism because of this and this and this. But it's really like watching paint dry. I mean, it's just, oh, it's, I, and I understand for you guys it must be absolutely hideous too. But it's, it's very frustrating because it seems like they're moving away from the actual point of the argument of I can prove God exists to uh, the structure of the argument being perfect. And it seems to just escape why we're even talking about it. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I'll admit to being slightly uh, tired and groggy today, but I, I have no problem arguing at either level, both conversationally or with syllogisms. And to me, they're not like paint dry, but I'm a bit of kind of a, uh, a logic slash philosophy masochist in that I'm the guy who had Matt Slick on for 45 minutes doing tag, which for most people, well, they'd rather scrape out their eyeballs with a spoon. <laughs> yes, and that's, that, that's one of the ones I watched, that, that it seemed yeah. to fall deeply, deeply into the structure of the argument uh, and kind of get away from why we're talking about this, and it was a little frustrating. Just, I think, for the general uh, viewer, it's a little frustrating. I have, I have reminded theists that tried to come at me with, you know, a uh, great big... Um, 
you know, plotted out logical argument that, hey, you know, you are the guys who are claiming that this is the message from your invisible friend for everybody on the planet who's supposed to be able to just get it. And um, you're, you're already on shaky ground if you need to resort to this kind of thing to make your point. Yeah, it's like resorting to magic, you know. It's one of the it's one of the points that I, I bring up uh, in the secular morality lecture is that some things just don't pass the sniff test. We don't we don't need to spend a lot of time on you know analyzing syllogistic structure or anything else because if at the end of the day, let's say some theist, which I mean many people are convinced that Alvin Plantinga has done this with his modal logic argument version of the the ontological argument. Mm -hmm. have produced a foolproof argument that demonstrates that a god must exist. Um, it's still utterly unconvincing because, first of all, uh, uh, almost nobody can actually understand his argument. Right. And second of all, there's not actual evidence supporting it. Uh, even the people who do understand the argument don't understand the flaws with, you know, or the potential flaws of what he's trying to say. At the end of the day, you could present to me an argument that I could not refute because, mm -hmm. because I simply either don't understand it, don't have the expertise, um, or I'm unable to spot the flaw in it. But it won't convince me on its own. Because until there's evidence to support that, unless, right. unless I have been completely convinced that the premises are true and the form is valid, I'm unlikely to accept the conclusion. I'm more likely to say, I don't know what's wrong with it, but until you can present evidence, I still suspect that there's something wrong with it. Right, right, right. And, and I think my point is that if it really all is, is based on faith, then why do you have to go into a huge logical argument? Not that, on your that part. That is really another darn YouTube, good point. It's like trickery to them to go into a logical argument. Not like, only that, but if this is, if this is as many Christians would, would posit, not just a matter of faith, but obvious and supported by evidence, why would they ever try to construct an argument like this? Yeah, on right. the one hand, we have the theists who say, well, go outside and look at the trees. <laughs> and that's your proof that there's a God. Yeah. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have these guys. Yeah. So, okay, I, I don't want to go on for a long time because I, I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, so to say. But um, anyway, the other thing is that as growing up, we went to church every Sunday, and I didn't, I, I'm an atheist from the get-go. I didn't believe it from the day I went. <clears throat> and I didn't really understand what being an atheist was. I thought you had to make a decision that there's a God, like these people did, or there's sure. no God. And I wasn't you know, emotionally ready to make that decision, wasn't intellectually ready to make that decision, and I didn't understand I didn't need to make that decision. But it was okay to say, I don't believe it. So I really appreciate you guys and the show I've been watching for about a year to get that finally. It's okay to say, I don't believe it, and I don't, I've, you know, I've read the book, I've seen the movie, I don't believe it. <clears throat> I read the book, saw the movie, got the t-shirt, went to the, <laughs> yeah. the, the pre-release yeah. parties, and uh, yeah, don't believe it. Yeah. So anyway, I know you got other callers waiting, but I'll, I'll give you the uh, theist uh, atheist joke. So ah. for some reason, a theist and an atheist are walking along together, and they get kidnapped. And uh, the kidnappers tell them, uh, "We're going to kill you, but you get one final wish." And the theist is an apologist, and he says, "I have this wonderful speech that proves the existence of God, and I want to give it one more time before I die." And they look over at the atheist, and they and he says, "I'd like for you to shoot me before he gives that speech." <laughs> Oh, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> you can recycle that one. That, I, I will. That yeah. is too good. All right, thanks, Andy. Thanks, guys. Bye. Appreciate it. We've got Ryan in St. Louis. How are you? Good. How are you? Not too bad. Um, I was just want to talk about um, when you guys before were saying that the idea of what's the harm is kind of irrelevant, whereas we should be concentrating on is it true? Mm -hmm. And... I kind of, maybe I'm missing something, but I kind of see it the other way around, that truth is, has no inherent value to it, it only is helpful if it reduces harm. So I think what's the harm should be the, the key issue. Hmm. I didn't mean to say that, that harm isn't important, but there, uh, On the question of whether you're, you should hold a particular belief, if you hold a particular belief just in, in, in the face of the facts, just because you think you're going to cause less harm that way, then I think you're wrong. 
I think that if you latch on to a belief merely because you want to, to do less harm, then you're not paying attention to reality. And the best way to cause a lot of harm is not to pay attention to reality. And I think, in addition to what Jeff said, truth is paramount. I'm not devaluing harm because I will fully admit that there are occasions where the truth must be suspended in order to prevent harm. Um, things like we're hiding Jews upstairs and the Nazis come and knock on the door and you know they say, are they here? I'm not going to tell the truth. Um, I'm preventing obvious harm there. I think those are simple cases. What I think happens too many times is somebody presumes that they can see the full scope of potential harm of something and so it, the harm gets overemphasized. When we talk to people, one of the most common what's the harm subjects is so-and-so has just lost a, a loved one. Um, they've died and they are comforted by what I consider to be a delusion that this loved one is in a better place. And people would say, it's, there's no reason for us to try to take away this particular delusion, even if we were to know that it wasn't true. I mean, in my case, I have no reason to think that they're in a better place. I do not have evidence that they're not, other than everything I know about who they are is lying there in a box. Um, but so the, the, the claim is, what's wrong with letting them keep these harmful delusions? Maybe nothing, um, but maybe everything. I'm not walking into funerals, I'm not going to the funerals of people that I care about and walking up to the people who are saying, oh, you know, wasn't Grandpa awesome and he's now in a better place and uh, blah, 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 and he's looking down on us and someday we get to rejoin with him. I'm not walking up to those people and saying, you're a delusional nutbag. What I am saying, though, is that if we understood and dealt with these things in terms of truth, we might find that that delusion is actually preventing us from dealing with the situation honestly in a way that is much more beneficial. For example, providing a delusion that, that kind of assuages our guilt may not be as effective as having a better understanding about what life is and when it might end from the get-go. Because if you grow your entire, you spend your entire life with the understanding that this is the one and only life that you're, you're going to get, that we have no idea it, what, if anything, happens to us after death, then all of a sudden death takes on a different tenor. Death takes on something where, yes, you can grieve the loss of somebody, but you can do it in a way that perhaps may be more healthy. And that the delusions that people have been latching onto are preventing them from developing healthier relationships and preventing them from dealing with each other in more honest ways for the course of their life. We don't know. It may be the case that lies do result in the better possible world in that type of scenario, and it may be the case that they don't. But I think it is monumentally arrogant and harmful of people to presume that they know and therefore say that this is the only, we need to let people keep their delusions. I'm not convinced we need to. I'm convinced enough that I'm not going to go tramping through somebody's funeral, but I'm not convinced enough that I'm not going to be striving to teach people this outside of the funeral to help people come to the recognition about what life is so that maybe when they get to the funeral, they won't bother to, you know, trying to delude themselves. I don't know. Okay, good speech. Thanks. Uh, one last question before I go. Um, is the, the way people answer this a lot of times surprises me, but I was curious how you answered. If you could choose to be happy or right, but not both, which one would you choose? Right. I see, and I, I kind of reject that. No, now hang on. Let me explain. The um, question I meant. I, it, it, you, all you gave me was a ch the the ability to choose to be happy or right. You're not telling me that you your your scenario does not say that if I'm right, then I can't be happy. I, but I would rather be the guy who's right, and then from that position try to achieve happiness, and because I think that's. Uh, that's the way to go. If I'm just happy, I could also be not right, and then I'm flailing around. Yeah, that, you know. but that violates the premise of my question. It I does. You Your premise. One or the other. It's yeah, which is I really why I can't. I absolutely can't be happy if I'm right. Yeah, then I reject the premise as well. I thought you were just giving me two two optional wishes, right? 
Uh, if I wish to be, to be right, then I, from once I'm right, then I can work on happy. But if I just wish to be happy, then I'm done. Yeah, I, I, ha I have to reject the premise accomplished anything. because I too would choose to be right over being happy, but I would choose it because being right makes me happy. <laughs> okay, so, but then, yeah, I get it. I mean, if you, if, you, if you gave me, if you, if you actually said, here are the only options, you can be happy and you're wrong, or you can be correct and you're miserable, I'd probably still go with being correct because I have this craving to understand reality as accurately as possible. Um, and the, the fact of the matter is sometimes... But that craving is like happiness, right? So yeah, again, yeah which, is why I had to, which is why I had to... Which is why I had to... craving. Which is why I had to reject the premise. The thing is, there's another aspect of that, uh, that craving. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't separate the two. I'm saying if we were forced to, I'd still go with the right because I have an insatiable uh, curiosity about the universe. And even if I found that I wasn't being happy, uh, I mean, if, if I was actually given a choice. Fortunately, we don't have to, to accept the premise and we don't have to make that choice. I can be right and be happy, and I usually am both. Okay. How's that? <laughs> That's good. All right. Well, thanks for, thanks for taking my call then. Sure. Thanks, thanks Ryan. Ryan. Everybody wants to be right. I think a lot of the motivation of, uh, of things like faith is it's a way of cutting you know, straight to the chase. I get the feeling that I'm right without having to do any of the hard work. Yeah. The, the harsh reality is that um, the truth isn't always something that's going to make you happy. Oh, it's one of the questions you know, that come up in these little games about, would you want to know? So you're dying of cancer, would uh -huh. you want to know? Um, for some people, like me, the immediate answer is, hell yeah. Right. I want to know. I want to know for lots of reasons, because I, I want to know as much about everything as I possibly can, but also because there may be things I can do about it. Well, it may be the case that I'm terminal and have you know, three days to, to live, and there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. Um, and some people might look at that and say, well, gosh, that'd just make me miserable, so I don't want to know. No. It would make me happy because instead of, for example, I don't know, sitting around watching TV and answering emails for three days, <laughs> I'd go do something else for those three days if right. I knew they were my last Right, three. and then some prick as you're dying, you know, in your last five yeah. seconds says, I could have told you three days ago, but I thought you'd be happier not knowing. Oh, that would be so <laughs> irritating. Oh, you're, you're laying there and you're struggling for breath and, and the doctor comes in and says, uh, we knew you were going to die today about a, three or four days ago, but we decided it was in your best interest not to Ah, who are you to presume what's right for me? <laughs> right. So, yeah, I'd want to know. Um, we're, we're queuing up one other caller. There's only about mm, six minutes left in the show or so. And now there's two calls on the line. Probably won't get to both of them. We didn't get any calls about the so-called Ground Zero mosque. Do we want to say something about that ourselves? Wow. Uh, sure, you or, can hit it real quick while they're queuing this one up. Um, I'll just say, uh, I thought that religion was dangerous and stupid on September 10, and I still thought so on September 12, and the only difference was that uh, a pl uh, some planes full of uh, Muslims had given me a really excellent uh, example. Uh, and, of course, thousands of people died. Um, the laws haven't changed. And, the, uh, and the, the, this nonsense that somehow there's something magically different about that spot because thousands of people died there that means that the laws need to be set aside so that the, these other people who happen to have the same religion, even if they were in favor of 9-11, that they then can't have their building, is, I think, ridiculous. Yeah. And then you add in the fact that it's five blocks away, which is by and large irrelevant, but... Um, and that there's already a mosque that's closer, that's been there since before the towers. Um, whether, whether or not it's in good taste, I, I don't care. I'm not convinced that it's not in good taste. I, I've, everybody I've heard talk about this from Sam Harris on down. I think, I think Pat Condell is, is, has gone over the top on this. I think that Sam Harris, by saying, yes, it's illegal, but, or yes, it's legal and should be, but it's in really bad taste, so we shouldn't do it. I think they're all wrong. I think the, the fact of the matter is that we live in a uh, diverse society where freedom of religion is one of the things that we cherish and protect and that if a particular spot of land would would allow a religious organization to build a facility on there of any type whether it's a mosque or community center or a taco stand um, that 
you know, brings in funds for their church, you have to allow any religion to do it. It's, I, it's all I, or nothing. I think it is in bad taste in the same sense that Denise believing that, uh, that uh, it's my choice that I'm going to be tortured forever is in bad taste. But I, you won't hear me saying that Denise's church can't have a building. Well, the question is, do you think it would be in bad taste to put any religious building there or just Muslims? Because if you just think it's in bad taste because it's Muslims, then I think... I, I think all religious buildings are in bad taste for pretty much those same reasons, but it's, they're not illegal, and that's, not, yeah. that's really not an issue. All right, probably last call of the day, Jim in Louisville. How you doing? Hello, how you doing today? Pretty Thank good. We, we only have a couple minutes. I'm sorry you called in towards the end of the show, so get to it quick. Well, basically, I, I heard you chatting about the mosque in uh, New York, and the only point I have to make on that particular subject is, uh, you know, I agree that we do live in a country of religious freedom. Uh, that's all well and fine. But I think there's so much persecution towards the Christian faith right now because there's a Christian uh, establishment there that has been uh, held up with uh, red tape, cannot get their building rebuilt after it was destroyed after 9-11, and yet this mosque can move forward. So I, I just really think that that is totally wrong, that they're going to be let the Christians be persecuted and allow these mosques per to be pushed forward. Red tape equals persecution, Jim? Uh, it, it does when you can actually uh, allow a mosque to move forward. So no, 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 no. The two faith, different buildings, two different... Rebuilt after Jim. It was there for much longer time. It was Jim. there for over 100 years, if I Jim. remember correctly. Jim, two different buildings, two different locations, two different legal situations. If one is encountered red tape and the other is not, it's not persecution. And it's not like, oh, you know, because we're letting the Muslims go ahead and build theirs, therefore we should ignore whatever... Uh, you know, legal red tape the, uh, the, the Christian church has run into. Two different situations, and uh, it, it, it's not persecution. That's ridiculous. Okay, well, let me pass another thing at, at you on this particular situation. Okay. How about the um, funding for this particular establishment? What about uh, it? They're already talking about how they're going to take funding from any source, including overseas, and a lot of these funding sources are going to be terrorist organizations. So Should what? that be allowed? The if they want to build a McDonald's and take some funds from overseas, are you going to object to that? If it's from a terrorist organization, yes, sir, I would. If there are, okay, if then there are laws, consistent. if there are laws in place blocking funds from terrorist or organizations entering the United States for any purpose, then those laws are in place, and those and those laws should be applied. I agree. Okay, but no, special new laws shouldn't be put in place just to stop this building. No, I'm not saying that at all. Okay. What well, I'm we're agreed is on that. They've one. already made mention that they're going to allow different organizations to fund this particular building through uh, many different uh, finance channels, and we need to make sure that that is not going to be terrorist funds. Because all this Why? is, this is a victory mosque. What? This is a no. victory mosque, very similar to the one that they planted in Jerusalem on, on the Temple Mount. They're really? trying to put a mosque that's showing that they beat us. That's all this is. So, they beat, so wait a minute. So, so, they, let, me, so let me ask you this. Um, when a Christian church is built five blocks away from an abortion clinic that was bombed by a Christian, is that a victory church? Not at all. Then go because away. And since when did they beat us? I mean, they can believe whatever bizarre nonsense that they want. In fact, I think they already do. This, this since when did they beat us? Are we all Muslims now? We're, we're out of time. Okay. Uh, and I don't have time for oversimplifications and people in a majority position who want to cry persecution uh, about an apples and oranges comparison. Um, I already gave a list of the things that are coming up. Please visit, stop by the website, www.atheist-community.org for more information about things that are coming up. There's the crew. I don't know if their camera's working or not, uh, but they're the ones who actually make this stuff work. So thanks a lot there to everybody who called in, and we'll thanks, see guys. you all next week. Feel free to drop by Threadgills. We'll be there shortly. Bye-bye.